morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, a very warm morning to every one of you. Uh, for those who are still working from home, glad to have you here. Um, today, I think we, we are going to actually cover one of the most exciting topics okay, in, in recent months. Or rather, it's actually something that's always on the mind of business achieve communities. Okay, so I, I actually name it the game changer series mainly because I think given challenging times, especially a crisis like this, is extremely important for us to look ahead. Okay, rather than taking it as a crisis, I guess it's also where the opportunity lies. Okay, so the name of the game changer series comes about because I was conceptualizing something to value add a lot more to people, to communities, to students alike, um, and even to business professionals. Today, we are actually facing one of the most challenging times okay, in generations, okay, in the past generations and the future generations to come. So I thought today it would be great if we could actually spend one and a half hours okay, to go through some of these exciting topics and together we will explore certain terrains and certain actually um, concepts okay, that will help you a lot in terms of knowing how to thrive, how to survive, or even how to excel okay, in these unprecedented times. Okay, so now it's actually 10. Okay, for those who have just joined us, I guess I, I would not want to actually hold you back too much because otherwise it will drag on okay, in terms of timing. So a quick introduction about me. Okay, obviously this entire series, webinar series, is not about me, but rather I think it's important for you on the other side of the screen to understand who you're speaking to. Okay, so there are five interesting facts, okay, about who I am, what I've done, okay, and why am I speaking, okay, on this topic. Yeah, I, I used to be a lecturer, okay, with a couple of universities, um, that was actually for a good six and a half years. I teach nothing but innovation, okay? And innovation itself, six years ago, was not as exciting as today. Today, we are facing all these actually business challenges, all these different re restrictions that makes actually the topic even more glaring, okay? And for someone who has been teaching for the last six years, okay, uh, people have not given a lot of actually talks or attention to this topic. So, as someone who has been advocating innovation, has been teaching the same units over and over again, I thought it's a good time for me to share what I have been building, or rather what my students have been equipped with, okay, to move ahead in this time. So, obviously, my biggest research interest will be Asian innovation. I study a lot of Asian case studies to companies, how they digitize, how they transform, how they morph into bigger things. Okay, and with innovation, there are always certain prerequisites or ingredients that must be there. So I'm going to go through some of these ingredients, okay, and share with you some of these darker secrets, as you call, um, that actually these companies possess. Okay, so I'm also actually the chief editor. I'm also a professional trainer. Um, I've been doing seminars, topics, and workshops since the age of 24. So if I count very quickly, no less than 10 years to, to even coming close to 15 years. Okay, of my life has been very much dedicated to training, teaching, and lecturing. Okay, and a bit more on my education background. Um, I'm a US graduate. I, I hold a lot of actually credentials, and I mean, being a US grad allows me to see the other side of the coin, right? Because if I'm focusing on just Asia, then I'm probably a bit myopic. But because I could actually gather insights from the other side of the world, I think it's actually where the East and West meet each other. And, and with that, I would like to actually share with you a bit more of my expectations okay, as a presenter. Uh, now it's actually 10, we should have started at 10 exactly. So the presentation itself, okay, or rather this webinar, okay, I'm under a pretty tight time constraint. I only have one and a half hours, plus minus. Okay. I would like actually everyone okay, to participate in the chat session later on, as well as during the Q&A. So I'll try my very best. Okay, to answer any questions that you have. Okay, and along the way, you're going to see examples. Okay, many of them household examples. Uh, and you know, in the past sessions, people have asked me, why are you using actually all these blockbuster companies? Why aren't you looking at smaller companies like SMEs? I would love to. And in fact, I have built that into part of my courses. Unfortunately, 
For the sake of bringing everybody up to speed, I will be using a lot more of multinationals, a lot of large corporations that you should be very familiar with. Okay, so your learning curve will be really short. Okay, and really, really actually fruitful in the next one and a half years. Uh, one and a half months, sorry. Uh, one and a half hours. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, so a small little hiccup here and there. Okay, unexpected. Okay, today the topic that I'm going to go through is about business model innovation. It's a very, very exciting topic in my perspective. Probably applies to you as well as a corporation as well. Because a lot of key notes, okay, uh, today, speeches, are all about business innovation, also known as business model innovation. So there's a saying when we are teaching or when we're delivering similar topics. We say that for business innovation, that's when actually the game gets tough. Okay, and that's in new normal times, not even during this crisis period. So when you actually face with a crisis, competition is definitely getting even stiffer. So rather than you actually fight the competition head on, okay, trying to actually burn your last marketing dollar, okay, to get hold of customers, to get hold of the best deal, I think we should actually take a step backwards, look at how we could actually change, okay, the dynamics of certain industry or certain gameplay that you have been really used to, okay? So business model innovation is exactly what I've been advocating for the last six and a half years. Um, so over the years itself, I've come across many interesting examples. However, I have not seen, okay, a period where people start to talk about it. National leaders, okay, like for example, our Prime Minister, okay, of Singapore. Okay, PM Lee highlighted Okay, three advantages that will help Singapore to secure its future. And when I was reading this article, what caught my eye, okay, was exactly this, where he highlights that, okay, we will have to support businesses to transform themselves, to change their business models, or move into different and more promising fields. The key words here, transform themselves, okay? Transform themselves not in the sense of aesthetics, not in the sense of just products, but more towards business model. Okay, what is wrong with these business models that you've been used to? Well, that brings us to actually to the case, right? So what are business models in the first place? Okay, why do we need to change? Why do we need to transform? Okay, we will go into that as we go deeper into this webinar. All right, so PMD said this, all right? And is PMD just the only one who said that? Well, uh, unfortunately, no, okay? Our Deputy Prime Minister of Singapore, okay, Mr. Hing Sui Kiet, said something similar, okay? There are some business models that will be broken. So what are business models that are broken? These are usually models which are very conventional, pretty old school, you know, nobody has questioned their models for decades, okay? And they're just ripe for disruption. They're just ready to, to embrace someone newer who comes on board, who looks at a better way of doing things. Okay, so these are the business models that are always seriously questioned. So if you have grown up with a business model, they have gone unchallenged, great. Okay, however, that is only in the past. Okay, the future will be where someone gets prepared to disrupt you. Okay, and in business model innovation, I could actually share with you a bit more of a saying. Okay, remember, no matter how successful your business is, there is always a youngster out there who's working from a garage, okay, or in the comfort of a dormitory, who's planning to put a silver bullet through your business organization, okay? It's just that they have not morphed and they have not evolved. So always be on the lookout for business model changes, okay? And not, that's not even during crisis. That's before crisis. Now, especially with crisis, I think there's a need for everybody to accelerate, okay, this change. So if we don't change, well, you're just ready and waiting, okay, for someone to change the whole industry, right? Okay, so just want to highlight a bit more, okay, very recently, in fact, about three days ago, okay, uh, the Singapore Minister for Trade and Industry, Mr. Chan Chun Seng, said companies should look to transform business models as Singapore reopens. So today is the last day, all right, of phase one in Singapore. So tomorrow, all businesses or majority of businesses should come alive, okay? They are going to actually open their doors. They are going to welcome people. And 
That is when business models had tested once again. Okay, if you are thinking that digital business models are the only way, you are going to be terribly wrong after this webinar. Right? So here she's saying we are not going back to pre-COVID days. Okay, we will have to change and evolve business models to serve new markets, new customers, and you have to start as soon as possible. Okay, innovation itself on its own, it can be quite fuzzy for people who don't really read much about it, for people who don't really observe a lot, that's exactly where my role comes in, right? So by virtue, if you're going to spend at least one and a half hours with me, I'm going to try my best, okay, to decipher, to actually demystify innovation. And to start with that, I think it's important for us to first look at what's innovation. Okay, this is a definition that, that I subscribe to a lot, especially when I teach. So according to this definition, they say that innovation is a creation of a viable new offering. So what is exactly innovation? Yes, it's a viable new offering. So what is a viable new offering? Let's look at the word innovation on its own as a common word, okay, as a keyword. Okay, many people out there confuse innovation with invention. And even, even today, innovation is always, okay, associated with creativity, with design thinking, with transformation. Okay, let me tell you, these are all very different things, okay? Different expectations, different outcomes, different processes. But the most common one that I always get question, innovation, is it equals to invention? Now, I'm going to tell you, it's not the same. Invention is when you come with something new, but it has no viability, okay? Yes, it's new to the world, but nobody is willing to pay you for that. So, because it's actually invented, but nobody is going to pay you for that, so that is not innovation. Innovation needs to be a bit more than just invention. It has to be value added, okay? It must add meaning, it must add purpose to someone's lifestyle or someone's actual way of living. It must be financially sustainable and viable. What do you mean by that? If you are going to come up with something new, but nobody is going to pay you, then I guess it's only just a patent, okay? Or it's only a prototype. In innovation, someone must be willing to pay you good money, dollars and cents, okay, hard cash, to make it uh, equal to innovation, okay, and new. So what is new? When we say new, must it be new to a world? No, it can be new to an industry, it can be new to a market, uh, and in innovation, most of the time, okay, it's copied and borrowed for other similar industries. So for instance, if you're in hospitality today, right? So hospitality has a lot of things that we could learn from. For example, hospitals, okay? Especially the premium hospitals, they borrow ideas from all these hotels, okay? To improve their menu offerings, right? So if you go to some actually prestige and premium hospitals, you realize that you could even choose special menus, okay? Although you are a patient, right? So this idea was borrowed across industries and morph into a particular industry. So when we say new, it need not be 100% new to the world. It can be new to a market, an industry, a city, or a country, right? So what's the offering? Okay, so I'm going to go to the last keyword. What's the offering? Many people say offering is product. It's a service. It's a process. Yes, you're right, but you're only 30% right because there are other things than just products and services. You have systems. You have services, you have business models, and all these are what we call offering. Okay, so you realize that these few words, okay, it has deeper meaning than just a definition. It's actually to demystify what is innovation about. And the purpose of you being with me here today is to obviously know more how you can change certain things. How can you, how can you transform, how can you morph, how can you evolve, how can you actually question, okay, conventional business models. Right? So I'm going to use actually this particular book, something that I like pretty much and something that I've been using uh, in my classes for a couple of years. And obviously, the, the, actually the presentation that they're going to see are not just about this book. There are a lot more than just this book. But this is one of the few books okay, that I subscribe to very much because the concepts are pretty clear and sim simplistic. Okay, so what's actually the objectives of BMI, what I call business model innovation? Uh, remember, it's not body mass index, it's business model innovation. Four objectives. Okay, first objective 
is to satisfy existing unanswered market needs. So in, in this case, there's a gap. Okay, People will not be able to tell you exactly what they want unless you create an offering for them. So Apple was actually a product that came about to fulfill this objective. People back then didn't know what an iPhone is about. Nobody knows what's an iPod. And obviously, nobody ever saw an iPad. So Steve Jobs, together with Apple Corporation, okay, all the engineers and all the back-end teams, technical teams, came about to give us something that we didn't even know that we wanted so much, it's so much today. Okay, so uh, first objective is really met. Okay, second objective is to give you new ideas, new products, new technologies, new services. Okay, and without new technology, no new products or new services, markets are pretty much dead. There's no excitement. Okay, uh, investors are always looking for all this new growth. Okay, and second objective of BMI is to help you to bring new technologies, new products, and new services. Okay, so that your customers existing or prospective will be able to enjoy and decide whether should they continue to buy from you. The third objective, okay, and which is one of the most important objective in BMI, we want to improve an industry. We want to actually change the rules of the game of the industry. So in this case, we are disrupting. Or we are trying to actually, actually make the industry a bit different, okay, change the outlook, okay, change the aesthetics of this industry low and fuel while serving customers better. So here there's actually a need for a business model and a better one as well, all right? And lastly, to evolve, okay? To change, to create something from nothing, okay? To create an entire new market segment. And here we have actually people like Netflix, okay? During this crisis period, I'm sure a lot of you subscribe to Netflix. Uh, well, you probably will not be able to finish all the shows on Netflix, but Netflix, was actually someone who looked at how the DVD industry was, okay, about a few decades ago. And then they questioned themselves, can we continue to be in the DVD industry when people are buying less and less DVDs from us? People are not willing to pay and internet technologies are getting more and more robust. So they decided to discard, okay, their old business model and change to what they are today. So today they are one of the most exciting innovators. Okay, and later we're going to examine their business model. Okay, so objectives. Okay, besides those companies I mentioned, you have Tata Motors. Tata Motors is an Indian company, a big Indian conglomerate. Okay, with that, they come up with the Tata Nano. So what's a Tata Nano? It's actually the world's cheapest car. Okay, I ever had the luxury of sitting in one. Uh, my God, these are nowhere compared in comparison to the cheapest Toyota or the cheapest Nissan you have. Uh, this is really no fuels, okay? Completely no fuels. And in fact, the cheaper model, the, the first infant model of Tata Nano doesn't even have air condition, okay? You have to unwind your windows to, to enjoy the natural breeze, okay? That's coming uh, into your window, uh, the car windows, right? So Tata Nano, why did they actually come up with the world's cheapest car? Because when they were examining rural India or even cosmopolitan India, they realized that there's a rising class of middle class consumers. Uh, yes, their incomes are getting higher and higher. Uh, they can afford better and better stuff, okay, or more as lavish lifestyle, but it has not reached a point where they could buy high-end cars like the European brands. They will not be able to actually set aside some of money to even afford the very, very affordable Japanese brands. So the, the actually the Indian economy, Tata, okay, decided to say, okay, let's take it in our own hands. Let's look at whether are we able to design something using the cheapest ingredients, okay? The cheapest raw materials available. And with that, after years of R&D, they created the Tata Nano. So today, it's still the world's cheapest car, okay? But do not expect too much because it may not have touch oil. It does not have air condition, okay? It gives you four wheels, yes, but don't expect performance of this car, right? So Tata Nano, okay, was actually a product that came about to answer the needs of the rising Indian middle class consumers. Okay. Okay. Next, when we look at second objective, we have people like Nespresso. Okay. A lot of you actually take coffee every morning. Well, I do need coffee from time to time. Uh, besides the usual Starbucks feeds, sometimes we could actually have a coffee making machine uh, from Nespresso. So Nespresso was the first company that brought about capsule coffee. And many of you, if you actually look back into the history of this company, 
Uh, a lot of you didn't really know that Nespresso was selling capsule coffee through internet for many, many years. They didn't even have coffee equipment. They were selling capsule coffees, okay? And the only way you could lay your hands on, on this capsule refills, okay, or these brewing machines was to take out a credit card, pay them through actually the internet, through their website, before you get, you get capsule coffee. So it was quite innovative when it first came about. So capsule coffee was potentially trying to disrupt, okay, the coffee shops, okay, the food courts, or even the high-end, okay, uh, gourmet coffee that you see, like Starbucks, right? So Nespresso brings capsule coffee, okay, in the form of new products to you. So today, obviously, you see a lot more of their presence in brick and mortar stores. But if you trace back to the roots, they were pretty much an internet-based only retail chain, right? Okay, Nintendo. Yes, some of you are pretty excited about the release of PS5, okay, PlayStation 5. Uh, however, it's not available for release yet. But as much as Sony has been releasing um, PlayStations for many, many years, I still find that the one that really creates a totally different market is Nintendo. And they did that through a very simple machine, Wii. So what is really different about Wii? Okay, Wii itself okay, was looking at a serious gaming business. Okay, and serious gamers like me, okay, where we spend hours playing a particular game, trying to cross over to the next stage. We get really excited okay, with fantastic graphics, with very, very serious gameplay, with very actually decent plots, okay, or even a first fantastic game ending. But we did not do that. We was looking at the, the traditional um, gamers business and we're like, okay, why, why must actually gamers be gamers? That is an interesting question. Why must gamers be the, the typical um, teens, okay, or even the early 20s? Why can't it be someone else? So you then don't look at actually some of the more, actually other markets that were underserved, okay? They realized three audience, three types of audience were underserved. One, housewives, okay? They were actually having a lot of time at home, right? After doing the housework, they didn't have much to do. So probably a game to help them be stressed is actually the solution. So housewives were, were the first actually consumer market they look at. Second, retirees. Once again, these are people who actually had worked pretty much, contributed to the nation for a good period of time. But now they are pretty much having a lot of spare time. Okay. And the Nintendo was looking at that. Okay. The Nintendo was like, okay, maybe these people have a bit of time, they have a bit of cash, maybe they will want to play some simple games. And the third, that is really, really unconventional. Serious gamers like me, we are very much aloof from the world. Okay. When we play games, we probably don't care about the surroundings. We don't really even get actually any one more than one gamer to come on board. Here, the Nintendo takes actually the business model differently. They look at families. They are looking at kids as young as four years old, uh, as old as 80. So anyone from actually the age of four up to 80, as long as you can swing, okay? If you know this action, you can swing, Nintendo caters to you. So Nintendo was doing something different. They look at the gaming business. They said that, okay, if Sony is don't looking at serious gamers, let me take something away, okay? Let me look at other businesses or other consumer segments that Sony doesn't want to serve. And with that, you have actually the emergence of Wii, okay? So you also satisfy or to disrupt someone who's early in the market, okay? And last but not least, you have Zoom, okay? Now we're actually having this uh, webinar through Zoom. That's the main platform, okay? Uh, before this, a lot of people were saying, oh, you know, if I want to actually do business across nations, across countries, I must travel. I must speak to someone, I must see you face to face. Well, Zoom actually created a new exciting segment of learners who's ready to embrace technology. And you're one of them. Okay, imagine 10 years ago when Zoom wasn't even created. How are we able to deliver this content to you right now as we speak? So Zoom created a new segment. And earlier I mentioned Netflix. Okay, Netflix created an army of royal followers who wants nothing but serious contents across many different actually types of firms and movies, right? So we're going to look at a bit more. Okay, so here I would like to actually uh, bring you to a very simple model. It's called a business model. Okay, this business model itself, if I look at it, it can be dissected into nine sections. We're going to go through each one of these sections. Okay, but in the interest of time, I will not be able to zoom in exactly into every one of them. Okay, but 
The idea of a business model is to describe to you how I can create activities, how I can generate interest, how I can give value back to customers, and yet at the same time, convince you to pay me for that product or for that offering. Right? So there are nine boxes, okay? and to make it easier, okay, these are the nine building blocks. Okay? And nine building blocks all shows you the logic of how companies intend to make their first pot of gold. Right? So we're going to examine each one of these boxes okay, thoroughly. Don't be too worried okay, if I'm not going to actually spend too much time in this slide because there will be a lot more later on. Okay, so if we did dive into each boxes, you have key partners, you have activities, you have value proposition, you have customer relationship, you have customer segments, you have channels, you have resources, and last but not least, cost structure and revenue model. Right? So these are all the nine boxes. Okay, if I were to draw a line, okay, down the middle, okay, if I split this box, value proposition, split it to left and right, okay, those boxes on the left are what you're doing internally. Okay, that means it's usually confined and found within the company, right? Those that's on the right, okay, that means to the right, okay, of this value proposition that includes customer relationship, customer segments, channels, etc. These are external facing. That means these are the touch points that your customers will see, okay? They will be able to tell you whether they receive or do they feel uh, actually satisfied or dissatisfied, okay? So those at the bottom, these two boxes at the bottom, cost structure and cost revenue uh, and revenue model, these are how you actually manage your finances, okay? How you get your profit models, right? So interestingly, just through nine boxes, I can just explain to you very, very quickly, this is basically what a company does, right? So forget about going through thousands of books, forget about going through actually thousands of videos or going through thousands of webinars. This is exactly what businesses are about. Right? Just that we need to actually, in business model innovation, we need to take it forward. We need to actually look at each one of these boxes and see how we can do things better. So if I were to actually put this and superimpose it on a company like Coca-Cola, this is exactly what you see for Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola does this every day. Okay? What matters a lot to them? Okay? And if this doesn't matter to Coca-Cola, I seriously do not know what matters more. Okay? In very, very quick, actually simple words, by plotting them into your business models, you will know what is a critical point okay, of each businesses. So here, with business model canvas, we can actually allow you to paint pictures of new and existing business models. So it's a snapshot. Okay? It's just like a financial statement. right? It tells you a snapshot of the business performance at any stage of time. But that is only after one year. Of performance when you are really into existence. A business model canvas allows me okay, to dissect, to allow me to examine each one of these boxes before I reconstruct something very different. Okay, so without further ado, I'm going to not spend too much time on this slide. Let us go into the boxes, all right, and see what you can do a lot more. So focusing on customer segments, okay, all businesses need to know what customers are you serving, who are you serving, who are your intended audience, if you do not understand that, okay, you cannot actually segmentize or you cannot actually target properly, then there's very little purpose why you should go into business, right? Because you yourself, you are even clueless about who you should serve. So every time we talk about business model innovation, we will examine segments. Who is, who are your customers? Okay, so here there are two big questions. Which segments should you serve? Which segments should you ignore? So sometimes you may want to cater to everybody in the world. But you know, with limited resources, okay, you can't satisfy everybody. So that's when you need to actually take one step backwards. Ask yourself, okay, internally, who are the people that we really want to actually serve? And it's not only just about serving, but to exceed, okay, the expectations, right? So similarly, there are some segments you have no choice you have to give up because uh, it's just not money making, because they are not your intended audience, or because you don't have the right products or right offering for them. These are the segments that you should just cut away, okay, cut loss, right? And focus on people that you really are serious about serving, right? So when we design a business model, we need to first examine who are the intended customers, okay? And with that, only then can we morph into the next other, the next other few boxes, okay? Here, there are five examples, okay? You could go for mass market, 
Okay, that means you want to cater to everybody in Singapore or everyone in the world. Generally, you will find a customer in everybody. Okay, uh, someone will be interested. For example, education. Some people say that it is supposed to be mass market. Yes and no. Depends on which segment you're serving. Right? Niche market is when you say, okay, now I know I can't serve the whole world. I have limited resources. My product is very, very different. Uh, and probably I don't want everybody to buy because I cannot fulfill their needs as well. That's when I look at a particular segment, a small part of a target segment and say, okay, let me try my best to understand them very well. Okay? To the extent that I probably am not just like them. As a business owner, I probably know so much about them. I would love to help them. Okay? And finally, segmented is when I combine okay, different possibilities together, different industries, different business models to make it into a segmented customer segment. All right? And then diversified okay, will be when I try to cater to two very different industries. For example, uh, I'm from training, I'm from education. Imagine tomorrow I'm going to go into FMB. I'm going to start selling food in school. That's diversified. That's exactly diversification. Because I know students, when they come to me, besides um, actually the usual studies, they probably need drinks, they need food. So I start to open a, a tuck shop, maybe, or a canteen, or even a food court to cater them. So although I'm a school, right? Or I represent a school. So diversification is one of the most common customer segments that you could have. Okay, the last one is where things get exciting. Multi-sided platform. Okay, so how is multi-sided platform evident in your day-to-day? -day? Simple. Take your iPhones or your Samsungs out. Okay, open your iPhone and your Samsungs. Literally every single app that you see is a multi-sided platform. Right? So why are multi-sided platforms so exciting? Because multi-sided platforms built on what we call the network effect. Okay, later we're going to talk about 90 multi-sided platform. But just bear in mind, multi-sided platform looks at two audience, okay, two different type of customers. Very, very different, very distinct. And without these two different group of customers, there will not be such a, a, actually a business model. So here we are looking at two or um, three or even more types of customers that decides to come together to be part of a marketplace, right? So these are the five customer segments that all businesses will cater. I easily I will have covered at least ninety percent of all organizations, right? You cater to one of them, right? Okay. The second box talks about customer relation. So here we are talking about actually the level of understanding, the level of support that you're prepared to give, okay, to people who patronize you. So there are three ways, okay, to drive relationship. So first, customer acquisition. That means you go and look for new customers. You spend good marketing dollars. You find strangers who decide to say, okay, now I'm going to buy from you. That's customer acquisition. And then you have customer retention. People who are buying from you, I don't want them to leave, okay, to join another competitor or join another uh, different business, right? So I want them to stay stick with me. I want them to continue to buy from me. I would like to retain them as loyal customers. So that's customer, customer retention, okay? These two are very, very common, okay? You see in all businesses, you try to keep the, the old people, again, okay, the old customers with them, they'll try to entice new customers, but that's not very exciting, okay? The third type is when I do upselling, okay? When I do boosting of sales, I try to promote, I try to actually sell you something more than what you probably are prepared to buy. Amazon does this really well, okay? Amazon always gives you suggestions. Lazada always gives you suggestions. Every time you go to their website, you bought something, and guess what? Before you check out, they're gonna come up with another series of products that you may consider buying. That is upselling. And that is one of the most exciting ways of pushing revenue upwards. Okay, this actually customer relationship deeply influences your customer experience. Because if customers are not happy with you, customers don't really like what you're offering. Obviously, they will not stay with you, right? So in that, we have to look at five types of relationship. Okay, so these are the five main types of relationship that anyone can have. So here we have personal assistance, we have self-service, we have automated service, we have co-creation, we have communities. Okay, because in terms of time, I cannot go through all five. Otherwise, I'll be really much behind time. I'm going to only focus on self-service. Okay, uh, because of COVID situation, a lot of you probably will actually take aways. Okay, buy takeaways, right, from um, fast food giants like maybe Burger King, McDonald's. Okay, uh, today Burger King and McDonald's is very different versus 10 years ago. Because you notice that they are cashier, they counter. Okay, it's getting smaller and smaller. And in fact, usually meant by only one person. And to, in order for you to buy or place orders, okay, 
you will have to go to this automated machine, okay, also known as self-service kiosk. This self-service kiosk is exactly where self-service automation comes in, okay, the relationship that comes in. So self-service, instead of me helping you, okay, in person, I leave it to a machine. I, I let you actually choose, okay, but I have to make that make sure that this kiosk or this machine or this mechanism, okay, is able and reactive and engaging enough, okay, to share with you what a real person will be doing. So self-service is one of the most um, actually interesting way. And with that automation, AI comes into play, right? Artificial intelligence comes into play. And then we have co-creation. Okay, co-creation is something that doesn't really take on um, until actually the uh, co-founding or the co-sourcing takes place uh, about eight years ago. Okay, where is co-creation evident during the COVID situation? Uh, in fact, some of you probably have received 300 to $600 a few days ago, if you are Singaporean or PR, okay, I think Singaporean, you probably have received $300. That was a gift sent from our government. So this $300 to some people could mean a lot. To some people, probably doesn't mean much. Okay, co-creation comes about when actually communities like um, all these charities, okay, they decide to set up websites. They tell you, oh, you know, if you have this $300 or $600, maybe uh, it's not so much to you, you would like to consider donating. So here you have a lot of actually charities who's embracing co-creation today. Okay, they are selling donation websites. Okay, and they are encouraging all of you to contribute, to co-create, to come with contents, to contribute your efforts, contribute your time and your money to further that cause. So co-creation itself is getting more and more uh, interesting. And in co-creation, we have two types. We have co-funding, also known as crowdsourcing, okay, and crowdfunding. These are two types of co-creation. But um, that's a bit advanced okay, in, in this webinar, so I will not be coming too much. But co-creation is going to be actually um, quite prevalent okay, in the, actually the months to come. And in fact, you'll see that to be getting bigger and bigger as you, uh, as communities start to digitize okay, and, and actually evolve. Right? Okay, communities, okay, ecosystems. I'm talking about creating an ecosystem around the company. Um, Apple is one of the smartest and the most robust ecosystems. Samsung is trying to play catch up as well. Okay, even actually other um, communities, like for example, communities like New Cities are trying to actually create communities uh, and ecosystems around them. So, why is communities are, are very important? Because they understand if this is going to be a one off, okay, transactional relationship that I have, you may walk away someday, right? But if I actually use multiple ways, okay, to keep you in the, actually in the system, the chances of you walking away is getting less and less. The more engaged you are, the least you want to leave. So communities are actually where uh, companies today are trying to create more and more. So Nike, okay, think about Nike, think about Adidas, all these sportswear, okay, they are all coming to you in different ways. And they're using communities as one of the strongest cell, right? Okay, so going to a third box, key resources. Key resources, uh, I think a lot of people are aware what are resources, right? Resources are actually mainly in a few forms. They typically exist because they help you okay, to create a value proposition. They allow you to reach a market. They allow you to keep relationships with your customers or to earn revenue. Okay, but if I were to break them, okay, there are main four types. Okay, there are four types of resources. Human resources, you and me, okay, talents, basically. Okay, financial, money, capital, all comes under financial resources. Intellectual, something that you don't really see. So what are intellectual properties? These are patents. These are trademarks, these are trade secrets, or these are even uh, know-hows like recipes, okay? So these are things that you don't really see, but you know they have to be there because these are your secrets, okay, to doing business. So we call them intellectual. So intellectual properties are another key resource that you must protect, especially when it comes to innovation, right? The last one, and these are things that you probably have. These will be your machines, your equipment, uh, your delivery vans, Okay, your um, actually your factory outlet, so and so forth. These are physical resources. But that is actually what you need to have, right? So I will not spend too much time on key resources, but you have to examine what matters a lot, right? And key partners, okay? Here we are looking at actually people, external party who works with you, that helps you to make the business model work. So companies go into key alliances, they work with other parties, or they work with other organizations for three main purposes. So what are the three main purposes? First, is optimize their business models. Okay, Walmart is really smart. Walmart doesn't actually go very much into all the actually the, the full chain, the full supply chain. They work with suppliers 
okay, to keep a close tab on their GIP, uh, just in time delivery, and their stock take, their inventory management system. IKEA does the same as well. Okay, uh, so why are they trying to optimize their business models? Because they realize that if they are doing everything on their own, they cannot actually do it really well. So they have to outsource. They have to look at actually reliable partners, especially partners that's able to value that add to their business model. So they do that, they create alliances. Okay. They also actually go into alliances to reduce risk. Some projects are just mammoth. Okay. There is no way, no matter how huge your financial strengths are, there's no way you could actually embark on that. For example, downtown, the downtown line, okay, or the Thompson East Coast line, as we speak right now in Singapore. Uh, it's actually in development. It's about to be completed very soon in the next couple of, uh, in the next one year. Okay, and then you have heard about T5. Recently, T5 was being stopped. Okay, no company can take on these mega projects alone. Okay, even companies like Samsung, companies like Hitachi, okay, like Hyundai, they will have to partner each another to take on these projects. And not even the full project, they are going to take on parts of the project. So why are they doing strategy alliance? Because they want to minimize risk. Because certain projects can fail, right? Certain projects may not give you the promised land, promised riches. So they will have to look at how much risk tolerance they can adopt, okay? And look at working with others to minimize all these risk exposure. And then finally, resources. Certain cases, you may not have all resources. You may not even want to spend money or capital to develop everything. So if you have something that's your strength, and I'm looking for that particular strength of yours. I don't really need to create everything myself. I can always work with you, okay, to leverage on your strength. Okay, and that way I will still be able to enjoy the benefits without paying, okay, or without creating something completely new. So these are three reasons why companies create strategic alliances. Okay, these are the four relationships, okay, four types of partnerships between account organization and other businesses, right? So I would like to focus on Competition, which is number two. Okay, very, very different. A lot of you have heard of strategy alliances, a lot of you have heard about joint ventures, a lot of you have heard about buyer seller relationship. Let's talk about competition. Okay, competition itself is something that's very, very new. Okay, uh, in the past, especially now, a lot of companies okay are saying, Okay, let me compete with you. We are in the same business, we're in the same market segment. Okay, we are not friends, we are the arch enemies. Okay, we I hate you to the core. So all the more I should go about to destroy you if possible, or to make you bankrupt. But competition challenges that norm, challenges that notion. Okay, competition says we should, as competitors, we should embrace each another, we should share each another love, okay? And because we are in the same business together, the, the oyster is too big. Okay, let's split. Let's split the market, let's split the pie, everybody gets what we deserve, okay? But we minimize competition, okay? And instead of us competing with each another, let's work. With each another. So competition comes about from two words. Okay. Cooperation and competition. Okay. Competition is the new actually partnership that companies are trying to go into right today. And where can I actually see competition? Uh, especially when now the whole world, all the pharmaceutical companies, life science companies are all trying to find a vaccine, okay, for COVID-19. US like giants like GSK, Mars, okay or even your traditional farmers, okay, they are all trying their very best. They are putting their resources together to help humankind, okay, in search of the possible vaccines. So instead of them actually competing with each other, they are trying to share resources, they are trying to share know-how. They even have actually co-officers or co-labs, okay, to search for the next vaccine, right? So competition is here to stay, even for a very, very actually hostile industry like pharmaceutical. So the next box that we look at will be key activities. Here, we are looking at the day-to-day. -day. What are the most important things that a company must do? I'll put it into four things, okay? How to create a value proposition that customers cannot say uh, no to, okay? And they will have to embrace the company because you offer something of meaning to them, something of purpose, okay? The second action, important action that, that they must adopt is to how, okay, to look at how to reach customers, how to reach different markets, how to stretch, okay, your products, to uncontested or how unexplored terrains, okay? So two is to extend your market reach, okay? Third is to keep your customers happy, to maintain their level of understanding, okay? And fourth, of course, to earn money, right? So key activities are targeted at four main things, okay? They are trying to create one of these four. So what are key activities? Three things, production, 
Okay, I produce something. I produce a product, I produce an offering, I give it to you. Okay, I sell you something tangible. All right, or I'll sell you something intangible. You use it and then you feel satisfied or you feel that there's some benefits that you enjoy. So that's production, very, very conventional. Okay, it's usually in a physical product business. All right, problem solving, for example, like education. Okay, you need to actually embrace yourself. You want to upgrade yourself. That's when I look at your issue. I look at some of your concerns. I give you a possible solution. All right, consultancy excels in that. Okay, hospitals excel in problem solving. Okay, can you actually imagine going to a hospital and then the doctor doesn't know how to solve your, your sickness or doesn't even have an idea what your sickness is about? Okay, so they are in the business of problem solving. And finally, um, platform and networks. I mentioned about this very briefly earlier. multi sided platforms, okay, they function as the new modern middleman. So as a modern middleman, what is it in for them? Why would they want to even actually connect two different groups of customers together? Okay, and all middlemen are out for one thing, commission. Okay, so you can actually perform one of these three activities, either production, problem solving, or you can try to be a middleman, okay, to connect parties together, right? Revenue streams, okay, uh, for people who are in accounting and finance or for people who are running businesses, this should not be too anything to you. We are basically looking at how you generate cash, okay, and how you get cash from each customer segment. There are two types of revenue, okay? First type, transactional revenue. These are usually one-off. I give you a product, give me the money. End of story, end of relationship. Then we meet again, okay? This is actually the type of revenue that's coming. So it's usually one type. Don't expect customers to come back to you again and again, okay, or every other month. So transactional revenues are very shallow in terms of relationship. Okay, the more exciting one is two recurring revenues. Okay, people subscribe, okay, to your business. People like your business. People like to patronize you on a monthly basis, if not a weekly basis. So recurring revenues happen literally every other month or at regular periods of time. So a lot of businesses today. Okay, conventional ones, they are still stuck with one, transactional revenues. Okay, I give you something, give me the money. Okay, till we meet again. And who, got, who, who knows uh, when, right? God knows when. So second is recurring revenues. And recurring revenues are exactly what business today should work towards, right? Okay, so seven ways. Okay, these are seven ways where we generate revenue streams. Um, I usually cover a lot more in my real classes, but because once again, in the interest of time, I can only talk so much, okay? So I'm going to focus on subscription fees. Okay, a lot of software companies today no longer just focus on giving you a software or giving you a particular CD, or neither do they just say, okay, let me install a machine for you, and then I'm sorry, you're not going to hear from them anymore. USA, they go into maintenance, and they are selling you softwares over the internet. You download yourself, they're not going to give you a CD or, or a hard disk, no such thing, okay? And they're gonna charge you, instead of charging one time, they're gonna charge you based on yearly, okay? Or if not, monthly. YouTube, okay, if you, you guys subscribe to YouTube videos, right? You realize that they changed their business model last year, okay? Now, they're gonna charge you a monthly subscription for having an ad-free YouTube, right? So, a lot of businesses today have already moved from traditional things like asset sale, advertising, brokerage, lending, licensing and they are all looking at how to make use of internet and technology to go into subscription okay subscription model very very exciting because it's recurring revenues right okay and then finally i'm going to talk a bit more about usage fee usage fee is something that you probably are very used to because a lot of you are probably still working from home every time you switch on the, the actually the power plug okay the the switch power switch okay you pay for electricity right so that was exactly how this model comes about, this revenue stream model comes about, pricing model. Okay, the more you use, the more I charge you. The less you use, the least I charge you. And these are very, very conventional, it has been around for many, many years, right? But usage fee goes beyond that. I charge you by the minute. I charge you by the kilobytes. I charge you by the amount of kilowatts that you use, okay? And usage fee is a way that companies today are evaluating. They're trying to move away from all the other traditional pricing models to go into usage, right? Okay, channels. Uh, this is how I communicate, how I articulate my value of frame, okay? How I share with my customers, okay? How do I entice them to come to me? So here we are looking at three things, communication, distribution, and sales channel, right? 
Uh, these are all the customer touch points. So these are basically how customers get to know about you. And they play a very important role, especially in um, actually deciding and creating the customer experience. I'm sure some of you heard about CX, customer experience. First, you have to look at your channel before you even look at your CX, right? Okay, three things, okay? You can go for your own channel, you develop your own sales team, you have your own brick and mortar stores, you could actually have your own distribution networks, okay? You could have um, host suppliers or distributors in different countries, that's your own, right? You could also go through partner channels. I mean, someone who is a wholesaler, okay, from another country, okay, you don't want to be in that country, you don't want to be in that market, but you can actually pass the distribution rights to someone else, okay, usually a third party. Okay, or you could go for a hybrid. Today, retails are suffering, okay, because a lot of retail chains, okay, are leveraging very much on own channels. They're using their own retail stocks. They're using their own sales people to reach out to customers. They have never bothered, okay? They have never actually tried very much to morph, to look at digitization. And that's why today, the government is telling you, yes, you want to keep your retail stores, you want to keep your F&B joints, no problem. But don't you think that you should do something more? You should actually look at maybe a combination of both. So digitization exactly captures that, all right? They want you to actually have your own conventional, what um, traditional, channels, but yet you cannot be missed, okay, the emergence of digitization, okay, and that's why the government right now is spending a lot of good money, a lot of funds to encourage companies to more, to digitize, okay, all right, so value proposition, ah, this is basically what customers will see you, okay, or what customers will prefer your company as, they are the reason why they choose you instead of others, okay, why they are going to come to you uh, and buy from you instead of going to another competitor. So here, I'm interested to share with you a bit on a bundle of products and services. And remember, it must create value. Value in whose eyes? Not the organization's eyes, not the business eyes. It's the eyes in the eyes of customers. In this case, we're talking about customer recall. We're talking about customer loyalty. We're talking about customer perception. And customer's mindset is really, really very crowded today, all right? So for example, if you are actually very much into uh, food delivery, okay, you're, you're, you're actually bombarded with so many options. You have grab food, you have delivery, and then you have all these new ones that's coming up. So who should you choose? I will only choose the one that probably is able to serve me well, able to give me tremendous value. So here, value creation is really important. Okay? So in value proposition, we want to look at the creation of a new market. We want to look at how we can solve issues of people. Okay, and get them to enjoy a better life or help them to overcome a, a problem that has been persisting for a long time. So value proposition is one of the most compelling reasons why you're staying in business today, right? Without value propositions, you should, as an organization, you should not be able to even survive the first three years, right? Okay, so let's look at 10 reasons, okay? These are 10 reasons why customers will choose a company over another. You have newness, you have performance, you have convenience, brand status, price, cost reduction, customization, getting a job done, accessibility and design, right? Okay, so today we will focus on a few of the of the 10. Customization, okay? If you go to actually eBay, or you go to even actually uh, Amazon, all right, even Lazada or, or Q Q10, okay, you realize that they always ask you to log in to your account. So why are they asking you to log in? Because when you log in, you already leave your past records. Okay, the AI behind that platforms is able to recognize your name. They are going to pull out the data and they know exactly what you have bought in the past. So when you're actually going to do suggestions, they are going to customize all these suggestions around what you use to patronize, okay, or what you have bought from them, or what you're searching for. So the level of customization is unlike before. When you walk into a shop, okay, you can browse everything. Now, when you go to online retail stores, by you logging in, they can really predict, okay, what you're likely to find or what you are going to be searching for. So that's customization, fitting you to a T, right? They understand a lot of, about you using consumer data. They understand a lot about you because of your search engines, okay, all the cookies that you have installed. They understand a lot about you because you told them that you volunteered, okay? You told them your dimensions, you told them what colors you like, so on and so forth. So customization is going to be there. Um, and it's one of the best ways for you to cater to the needs of every individual customer, okay? Keeping them extremely happy, 
right? Cost reduction, okay, especially during COVID, a lot of people say, you know, when I go for, for actually purchases, you know, I will want to have some discounts here and there. That's exactly what some companies are selling. Okay, but cost reduction is not just about giving you discounts. In cost reduction value proposition, what they're saying is that I'm going to give you the best value for money. Okay, Walmart excels in that. They tell you if you can match anything that is lower than us, you can have your money back. Right? We will refine you the, the difference. Okay, and in Singapore, some of the hypermarts, okay, that you've been used to, does that as well. Okay, if you, you all still remember this, this actually um, hypermart called Shop and Save. Some of you probably will know them. Okay, the parent of Shop and Save is Cold Storage. They are they're under the same parent company, but they are very, very different. Okay, their very proposition is very different. Okay, in Shop and Save, or also in this case, Sing Song, okay, Supermart, they tell you, come to me. I probably offer the lowest in Singapore. That's why you should buy your groceries from me. Okay, you can find something else, especially on a Thursday, okay, from my advertisement. Come to me, I'll refund you everything. So you go to actually all these hypermarts because you know that they can give you tremendous value for the price that you pay. So cost reduction was on their card. Okay, and then price, what's the difference between cost reduction and price? Okay, in many, many organizations today, they say, oh, you know, I must charge my customers a uh, particular price. Without price, I do not know what I can, how much I can earn, how much I can really receive in return. Okay, that's exactly what a lot of businesses have, have gone into. Okay, let me tell you about this very interesting company called Anywhere. Okay, it's A-N-Y-W-H-E-R. No E at the back. Okay, so this company itself is a Singaporean startup. Okay, they are a tourism and hospitality um, working company. So that, that means, in other words, they are a tour agency. Okay, what is interesting about their business model is that they allow you to go to their website. They don't have physical shop front. You go to their website. Okay, they ask you what's your budget. Okay, how much budget do you have if you want to go for holidays? Of course, now during COVID, you can't travel. But once actually uh, countries open up, that's when you will start to actually get excited about traveling, right? So you may want to bring your family abroad for a short getaway, but you have limited budget. Maybe you only have like $300, you know, for family. That's really pathetic, right? Okay, but no harm going to this actually organization website put in the budget that you have, say $300, right? And then you click submit. So what this company do is that once they receive your request, they are going to work with their networks around the world, okay? Network of all these actually uh, tourism spots, uh, destinations, etc. Depending on how many days you are going to be away, they're trying to do a match, okay, with you. And what's interesting, even if they find a match, they are not going to tell you. They are going to just send you an email, send you a small little envelope, they tell you, yes, you're going away for a getaway during this date and this time. Okay, please pack your luggage and these are things that you should be bringing. Okay, they even tell you what to bring for in your luggage. But the only thing that they don't tell you, where am I going? Which city am I going to? They will not tell you at all. So it's full of mystery. It's full of excitement. And it's exactly meeting your budget. You're like, oh, $300, I can get a family away. So how, where can I go? I, I, I don't even know. And this company is helping me do all this groundwork, all this research. So anywhere, okay, works on the notion of price. So how will you know, okay, which city you're going to? That's when you are at Changi Airport, okay? They will give you an envelope. This time now, a, a different envelope. You open up the envelope. They're going to tell you, okay, this is going to be a present surprise. Okay, you're going to actually Palaban in Indonesia. Uh, hold on, where's Palaban? Okay, I know it's Indonesia, but... Where's Palaman? Okay. And you're going to spend like three days there. So to people who are very adventurous, for people who are very open, for people who don't mind, okay, to go for a gateway uh, under a very tight budget, this is something very, very different. So this company itself excels in that. And it literally blew me away because for me as someone who teach innovation, I didn't know you could do that. You could surprise your customers in very different ways. And I have very strong advocates who use this every time they decide to go away. So no longer are they going to go to Jetstar uh, or are they going to AirAsia or are they going to visit SIA websites? They are just going to anywhere, okay? And make their bookings, right? Okay, so cost structure, once again, we are coming back to cost. These are the usual cost structures. It can be cost-driven, it can be value-driven. So in cost-driven, we are looking at minimization of cost. We, are, we want to be the cost leader. We want to be the cheapest, okay, in terms of cost. We want to have the lowest. So here, companies always compete. Who can cut costs more? Who can really be actually the lowest, okay, in terms of manufacturing costs for a product? So cost driven, the, the downside of cost driven is that you have to trade off. You will have to trade off quality for cost, 
Because while you're trying to keep your cost low, quality cannot be extremely high. It just works on the opposite direction. And that's exactly bringing you to value driven. So value driven talks about giving purpose, giving you meaning. And usually in value driven okay, cost structures, they are focused on keeping customers happy. Okay, cost is the last concern that they have. They want to make sure that you walk away really happy and knowing that you will probably come back very, very soon. Okay, for another repeat purchase. All right, so we've gone through very quickly nine boxes. Okay, once again, I'm going to bring you back to these nine boxes, what I call the business model canvas. We are going to use these nine boxes, okay, to examine, okay, a bit more on some of the patterns. All right, so fundamentally, pattern one. Okay, these are usually found in huge corporations. For example, Singtel, General Electric, um, Tata, Microsoft. Okay, you will find them. We call them the bundled business model. But in order to understand what their business model is about, we will have to unbundle them. Okay, so there are three types of business. Okay, customer relationship, where they focus a lot about keeping individual customers happy. Right, these are usually B to C. Okay, the second type is when they look at product innovation. They try to come up with something new, okay? Usually something physical, right? They want to actually keep you happy, ask you, okay, were you concerned buying this? Usually it's a prototype, it moves out of a prototype. And the last one is B2B, okay? Where they serve businesses and even competitors, okay? So in B2B business, infrastructure business, they are supporting other companies or other organizations, okay? Or even competitors in their game, right? So each type has different value, okay? Different competitive landscape, different culture and dimension. So for the purpose of this webinar, I can't go into each of these culture and dimension, but uh, in certain parts of my, my teaching itself, I'm going to share a lot more. How are we going to look at trends? How, and using these trends, how are we going to come up with the next exciting product, right? And these three types will all coexist, right? Sometimes it can be very complicated when you look at Singtel, okay? Or you look at the market holdings, or when you look at actually people like Grab, You'll be scratching your head. What's wrong? Okay, why is it that I cannot understand what they are doing? I mean, they seem to be everywhere, anywhere. Okay, so here we need to actually take one step backwards. We need to dissect. Okay, and let me help you to dissect. So, first one that you see is when I focus on B to C, business to consumer. Okay, here I'm looking at all the key partners, the key entities, the offer, relationship, clients, so and so forth. These are what matters to me a lot. Okay. And I would like to actually look at, oh, okay, key abilities. What are the most important things I need to do? What do I need to focus on? How do I go and build my channels? Okay, and how can I acquire it? But notice actually that in B2C, the cost of finding new customers is extremely high. Okay, but it contribute because it's B2C, you're talking about volume, right? It contributes a lot to your revenue. So here, there's a large share of wallet. Okay, and they are very customer centric. Okay, here the relationship that you develop with your customers must be rock solid. Okay, if not the best in the industry. Okay, when we go into actually um, infrastructure product, okay, product or service innovation, okay, here we are looking at how to create the next exciting um, offering. So here, instead of me looking at customers, I'm going to take one step backwards. Okay, your customers can be B2B or B2C. I'm not sure yet because I've not created a product. Okay, but I will have to focus a lot of my energy a lot of my resources on getting the right people invest a lot in r d okay to develop prototypes okay here what matters a lot are your key resources if you don't have strong talents you don't have innovative talents you will not be able to go into this at all full stop okay and if you are able to create the next exciting blockbuster product on the next blockbuster offering you are going to get premium pricing because you're the only one you're the first one okay who goes into this market and because of these talents that you're you are actually feeling that you're growing and you're developing right there's high employee cost okay so this is actually when you decide to go into r&d in the research okay in the development for a new product these are things that you need to focus on right and then finally when you serve b2b right in b2b business because i'm working with other corporations okay i need to sell to other organizations these are things that they will be looking at so b2b businesses are very interested in your infrastructure. So how can you support me? How can you give me something that I do not have? How can you actually make sure that my reliability, okay, your reliability itself is more solid, okay? So here they are looking at scale, they are looking at large volume, they are looking at fixed cost, okay? The lower the cost, the better it is, okay? And I could actually invest in this one time, 
But in return, I can't charge too high because you're going for volume. You have to use for commodities pricing. Okay, so how can we actually see bundle pricing? Singtel. A lot of you, like, like you and me, you know, we go to Singtel, we go to Saha, we go to M1, okay, we buy our handsets, we get our telco lines. Okay, so Singtel serves not only just you and me as B2C, they are also very much into B2B. That's why they have a corporate segment. They help organizations to get corporate lines, corporate handsets. Okay, but one thing that a lot of you didn't really know. Do you know that Singtel actually sells uh, bandwidth okay, to other telcos, okay, to people like Starhub? Okay? And, and how does Singtel actually get rewarded? Well, they are going to lease this okay, bandwidth or they are going to sell this bandwidth to other telcos in return for fee. And that's exactly where your third infrastructure business comes about. Right? So Singtel is very, very well developed. Okay? So they are very, very complicated. If you, you want to understand them, you have to go to bundled, okay, unbundled. Okay, business model. So DBS, okay, I think now is a time when, when everybody is very worried, okay, whether will you have enough finances to tie over this crisis, but DBS is not worried at all. Why? Because they have already morphed many years ago. You probably will see them as a consumer bank, but let me tell you, this consumer bank is unlike most consumer banks. A lot of you are not probably aware that they have a training academy, they have a DBS academy, and this DBS academy is a training outfit, okay, they are, they are actually based in Changi, Okay, Changi Business Park. So in Changi Business Park, they have a dedicated training facility where they train bankers, okay, from other banks, okay, on how, okay, to embrace fintech, okay, and they work with actually fintech providers, okay, to push the boundaries of mobile banking. So this DPS bank, you know them as actually your next door, okay, uh, friendly neighborhood bank, but they are not just sitting behind waiting for climax okay to change they have really morphed years ago and today if i will look at them from a training perspective well they are a training business they train other bankers and from other banks so competitors like dbs Citibank, uob so and so forth send their bankers to dbs academy to get trained and why does dbs subscribe to that simple dollars and cents okay i am able to demonstrate to you my talents my capabilities at the same time i get good revenue I get good money. Why not? So I think a lot of businesses today, you have to go beyond, okay, uh, dissect and then try to figure out what's really wrong, okay? And then they, they will be able to share with you a bit more. So second pattern, okay, because we're running a bit tight on time, okay, I want to give a, a bit of time for the Q&A. So second pattern is what I call the long tail. Okay, how, do, how does this word long tail comes about? Look at this orange lines, okay, all these columns that you see here. Okay, this is actually where the tail comes from. Right? So the blue lines are your best sellers. Okay? When you go to actually some businesses, you realize that they offer millions and millions of products. Okay? But not every product will be selling in the same quantity. Not every product will be best selling. Right? So in the long tail, they look at a small number of best sellers that accounts for a big portion of their revenue. And they are also interested in keeping cost low, inventory cost low, right? using strong platforms. And they try to make all these products available to anyone who wants to buy it anytime. So here, the key word is large number of products with low volume. Sometimes, okay, more is less. Less is more. So it can be reversed. So in this business model, okay, this is what matters. So they look at niche customers, okay, people who probably have very different needs, okay, with different ones. And they look at actually different providers as well. So it can be actually content, it can be product, okay, they can also use internet, okay, or physical shops, or physical shop fronts. These are your platforms, your channels. Okay, and they focus on offering many, many different, very diversified contents, very different offerings, um, so much that there's always something for you, okay, the moment you go to them, right? And more importantly, uh, they spend a lot of resources and time to develop the key platforms, okay? All right, so let's look at actually a bit more and some examples, Netflix. Okay, Netflix subscribes a long tail. How many of you dare to tell me that you finished watching all the shows in Netflix? I don't think anyone can, okay, logically, even if you're working from home, right? But Netflix has thousands and thousands and thousands of films and movies, okay? So why do they put everything, squeeze everything into an app or a website? They're just waiting for you, right? To click that watch button, okay, watch icon. Okay, because Netflix know that in order to cater to the world, okay, and every one of us, 
some of us like blockbuster movies, some of us like war movies, some of us like romantic movies, some of us like comedies. So Netflix will have to cater to every one of us. And they can't predict, okay, exactly who type or what type of person are you the first time you come about. But over time, okay, based on the movies that you have been watching, they will be able to give you suggestions. And that's when the AI comes into play. So if you look at actually the whole Netflix model, it was leveraging a long tail. Remember earlier I mentioned, you have a lot of products, okay? Some of these movies you probably won't watch at all, not in a lifetime, okay? But there'll be some, okay, US blockbuster firms that you watch, okay? These are the firms that bring millions and millions of dollars, okay, for the producers, right? So Netflix leverages on that. And then we have your supermarkets, okay? And here is just one gallery. Can you imagine a supermarket like Sing Song, NTUC, Cold Storage, how many thousands of products do they have? Do they seriously think that you can buy all these products every other day, every other week? No. But they know that the moment you walk into the supermarket, okay, you're probably looking for a particular item. And to keep you okay, uh, invested in this long tail, they are going to do promotional activities. Okay? Every Thursday, if you take a copy of your straight time, you flip okay, the, the papers. You'll find that actually all these hyper marks, promises, bargains here and there. Okay, and they'll tell you, oh, special price for this particular fish, special price for another meat product, come and visit me, only, the offer is only for today. This is when, okay, long tail is being executed. Because you probably will find it, hey, yeah, exactly, I, I, I like this product. It's exactly what I'm looking for. And today, there's a, such a special price. I cannot hesitate to pay a visit to the supermarket. Well, you're going to fall victim to long tail very quickly. Because the moment when you go into the supermarket, you're looking for that particular product, Okay, most people will not walk away with just one item. You will spend time browsing through the galleries, okay? And you'll always have this thinking, I'm seeing some here, I may as well. Uh, once you start to develop this thinking, I may as well. Long tail will get the better of you, okay? You will definitely walk away with more than just the item that you came for in the first place, right? So long tail, a nice, very exciting way, okay, to build businesses uh, and by giving variety, by giving you lots of choices, they are still able to make a lot tremendously, all right? Even though their inventory cost could be higher. Okay, multi-seller platform. Earlier uh, in the part of my presentation, I talked about multi-seller platform. Multi-seller platform talks about bringing two different business uh, customers together. So it can be individuals, it can be B2B. Okay, I become the connecting dot. Okay, and here on screen, you see a lot of companies that are all multi-seller platform. And this should not be too alien to you. With some of these companies, are found exactly in your phone, right? Okay, so what is exciting about multi-seller platform? Okay, this is only of value, okay? Multi-seller platform is only of value, okay? To one group of customers, only if the other customers are around. Okay, what do you mean by that? Okay, I have two different groups of customers, customer A and B. Customer A is looking for something. Okay, customer B is looking for customer A. Okay, that's when I become the platform. I help you to do the connection. And in the process of me connecting you, I'm going to earn good money. I'm going to earn a lot of my commission. Okay, so I facilitate interactions between these two groups. The more groups there are, the better it is. The more powerful network effects comes about. So what's the network effect? Okay, network effect grows in the extent that if uh, one group is not there, the other group will not be interested. So here is a balancing act. It's like a balancing beam. I need to have both groups that are equally enticed. Okay, I need to build both groups at the same time. Okay, and you make sure that both groups of, of customers, their service, are equally happy. And the bigger the network effect, okay, the stronger and the more promising this platform becomes. Okay, uh, some of the network effects, okay, have landed these new startups into multi-billion unicorns. Okay, and it's only just because of network effect. Unfortunately, you realize that some of these multi-side platforms, as much as they are really doing very well, um, they are facing a bit of challenges. For example, Airbnb, okay? Airbnb recently is under a bit of constraint because of tourism, okay? The drop in tourism. And even Grab is also facing a bit of concerns because nobody are taking taxi flights, okay? So they're under a bit of constraint. But still, even though all these problems, okay, that you see in the papers, they're still worth billions of dollars, okay? And that is not something that any normal corporations can match. And what's even more exciting and more uh, appealing they only took less than 10 years to become billion dollar corporations, okay? 
So let's look a bit on their model seller platforms. Okay, what matters a lot. Okay, you have said for model seller platform, their biggest interest is to develop a platform that works, a platform that engages customers, a platform that's able to carry out transactions. Okay, with just a few simple strokes of the mouse or if not the swipes, okay, of your finger swipes. Okay, they will look at actually value proposition one. So first you identify customer segment one. So what does this customer segment one? Okay, what can I do to entice them? How can I keep them into this platform and make sure that they use it on a daily basis, if not a monthly basis? So once I find a value proposition, okay, I appeal to this customer segment, I will get my first revenue flow in the form of commission. Okay, only if customer segment two is there. Okay, so what they do is that they will look at at least two customer segments. Okay, look at different value proposition for each one segment. And then in, in the search, okay, for revenue, they will try to facilitate the interactions between them, all right? And it can even go to three, it can be four, it can be five, or even more, right? So let's take a step backwards, okay? Let, let's look at actually the most important part. Why are they actually so exciting? Why are they billion dollar worth? Because they, in, when they first started, okay, they will have to burn lots of cash. They have to burn literally uh, every single dollar that they can have their hands on. So if you remember actually the, the growth of Airbnb, the growth of Grab, okay, things were not off to a rosy start. Even today, 10 years have passed, people are still questioning, why these multi sided platforms are still not money making? Why are they still actually a loss making? Because you see, in order to get network effect, something must go, okay? I cannot forever go into this business for the idea of making money from the first day. In multi sided platform, they have to build the networks quickly and effectively so here they have to use investors money to burn okay to get you enticed and once you're enticed okay it's a matter of time before they create a value proposition to bring that money back to the investors okay so at the beginning there's a possibility that you need to pay some customers in order to get the other group okay so grab when they first started to so people like you and me okay when we download grab a uh, taxi booking app or grab car whatever okay we didn't really have to pay a single cent okay so if we don't have to pay a single cent then why would grab want to spend so much advertising dollar going around the whole country the whole island to promote that's because they have to do this otherwise they will not be able to get their network effects started okay so in multi sided platform grab gives me a very good perspective today they are very very different they are normally just transport they are into food they are into parcel delivery they are into subscription Okay, they're into fintech as well. They are also selling movie tickets and even hotels. Okay, hotel bookings. So all this leverages on one common thing. So what's the platform? The app, the Grab app. That's the platform they have been developing for the last 10 years. They're trying to make it really smart with the use of AIs. Okay, so all you need is one common app and you can fulfill many different needs of customers. Okay, and the more data that you feed them, the smarter this app becomes. Okay, and in the process of doing that, okay, as a consumer, so who will be enticed? Taxi drivers will be enticed. Private car owners will be enticed. Okay, f &B owners will be enticed, right? Okay, so this is how they connect. And in between, okay, comes the question. So what's in for them? Why would they want to connect me and to the f &B outlets? Why would they want to connect me with all these grab car taxi providers? Simple, they get commission. How much commission? Okay, you'll be 50 cents per booking, Plus, okay, they will have to actually get 20% of the fare from the taxi driver or from the private car, okay? And does actually the Grab car driver or the uh, taxi driver who use app uh, Grab uh, booking pay? Yes, they pay. They pay 30 cents, right, per booking. So here, when we try to actually connect, when they try to connect, it's not free. We pay, okay? And we really need pay them for the convenience, right? So multi other platform. The next one is LinkedIn. This is usually a social media. Uh, used for connecting businesses or businesses or individuals to individuals, uh, especially in a business setting. So to all of us consumers, when you open up a LinkedIn account, we don't pay. But who pays, right? It's free to us. But advertisers pay, okay? You know, headhunters pay, right? Corporations pay. Why? Because they want to find our profiles, they want to connect with us, they want to speak to us, okay, about some possibilities, right? So LinkedIn, as much to consumers, is free because we're heavily subsidized by them is not free to the other side of the platform. It's not free to headhunters and advertisers, right? So that's when network effects comes about.
Okay, the fourth pattern will be business model. Okay, a very innate, very, very old school business model as well. Uh, free, when I give you things free. Okay, so when I give you things free, um, I call it freemium model. Okay, this is a freemium model. In the freemium model, there are two groups. People who get the base offering for, without paying a single cent. People who pay a slightly more okay, to get full service, okay, to get an elevated product or elevated offering. So here, at least one customer segment must be able to benefit from a free offering. Okay, so here there must be at least one customer who's willing to enjoy the benefits of a free offering. Okay, and then free uh, different patterns will make the free offer possible because some people pay, some people don't. So it's the people who are paying, okay, who are subsidizing people who are not paying. Okay, so it's usually either to when another customer someone pays for those people who are not paying, or the business will have to pay to and let those non-paying customers enjoy the offering. So freemium is actually very, very old school earlier. Uh, I mentioned that because when you walk into any hypermarts, okay, you will say sometimes you're offered free food. Do you need to pay any money for that? No. So it's also in innovation what we call bait and hook. How do we bait and hook? How do we give something like a carrot and then I'm going to actually bait you? Okay, it's like fishing, right? If you don't even bite the bait, how am you going to fish the fish? Out of the ocean. So bait and hook is one of the most powerful mechanisms today and used by FMB joints, used by hypermarks, used by a lot, a lot of actually people, even Gmail, okay, Hotmail, all right, all these are female model. So in female model, we look at first free service and to give free service, obviously I can't charge. So here you, you need to have a large consumer base, okay, and because it's free, right, so I have to give you a minimum level of service and I have to absorb the cost for that. Right? And then finally, I look at the other segment, people who are willing to pay a bit more to enjoy something better. So here is when people pay for an elevated offering, they will enjoy a higher level of satisfaction because the products are better, quality is higher, so and so forth. So that's actually how freemium model works. Some people pay, some people don't. People who don't pay, it's okay because you still get basic offering. But people who pay, would really get the full benefits of everything. So what is actually very important to a freemium model? Infrastructure, platform menu. Okay, you said the government has been advocating you should change your business model, you should look at actually how you go about serving customers, how you should change uh, the, your old ways of um, actually going to market. This is exactly what freemium is working about. Okay, they change the infrastructure. Okay, and they spend a lot of time to develop that. Zoom is an example. It's free to a lot of you. Some of you are probably joining me because you have a free account. Zoom doesn't charge you at all. But to, to us, okay, as an education institution, as a training institution, we have to subscribe because otherwise uh, we have to pay a monthly subscription. Otherwise, we can't post so many of you on the other side of the screen. Okay, uh, we can go up to thousands okay, at any stage of time. So Zoom is a freemium model, right? And then you have Spotify. Some of you who are very, very particular about music quality. Some of you will say, okay, you know, it's okay. I don't want to pay. I don't mind the advertisements one, once in a while. But it's so disruptive. It's so annoying. So for people who really treasure uh, the quality of sound, okay, the quality of music, you will be willing to pay $9.90 for the next three months to enjoy Spotify, okay, without burning your data. So for people who are actually a bit more cautious about spending, you can choose not to pay. Spotify still gives you a lot of uh, free offering, right? For, but for people who are a bit more concerned, People who really want to leverage the full maximum benefits out of Spotify app, you'll pay $9.90 per month. So Spotify is another example of freemium, okay? Freemium model. Okay, pattern five. This is something that's a bit abstract. You don't really see a lot, but I'm gonna make it into a very short uh, terminology so you can understand here. Open business model. So what's open? Open means I use external parties, I use strangers. I use people who probably doesn't know me very well to build up my business model. So I have two types, okay? Here, outside in, okay, and inside out. Outside in is what I mentioned earlier about co-funding, uh, co-sourcing. I invite strangers, I invite potential customers to tell me what they like, what they don't really like. Then using all this feedback, I go about looking at possibilities within an organization. So here, I'm going to bring outside ideas, okay? And I'm going to internalize them and come up with the next innovative way. Or I could, Follow Steve Jobs, okay? I could go inside out. I develop something in-house first. I put everything into a lab, okay? I create something, make it really robust, come up with a prototype. And then before I try to push out ideas, okay, our prototypes will test the market to see whether they are willing to pay. 
So most of the businesses today, conventional businesses, are always, always working on B, okay, inside out. That means I look at something internally first. And then once I think this product is more or less ready, I put it in the market, I introduce it to the market and hopefully the market buys. Okay, so that's very old school. A lot of businesses today are trying to go into A, outside in. I use my customers, I use my suppliers, I use my vendors, okay, to come up with the next exciting product, right? So in outside in, when I take audit ideas from outside, these are all the things that matters, okay? I start to bring these ideas in, I look at activities, how I can change things around, look at resources, I internalize, okay, before I push it out of the market. Right? And then these are examples, Kickstarter. Okay, it's not very common in Singapore that you hear about Kickstarter. Kickstarter is actually an entrepreneurship uh, community where they subscribe okay, to entrepreneurs, possible entrepreneurs. Okay, they don't put an age limit. If you have an interesting business idea, but you lack funding, okay, but you have a valid proposition that you think will work, go to Kickstarter, okay, share with the community uh, about your business idea and how much money you need to get started. So here you're not even investing a single cent. Okay, you're just putting your ideas into this platform, into this ecosystem. People will pledge, okay, their donations to you, right? So that you can go about starting business. So it's a very exciting way of going to business without using your own funds, right? However, there's a catch. Okay, if you put a target as say two million, okay, there are thresholds, and say the threshold is sixty percent. If you do not get six hundred thousand out of this one million, you are hoping for the project doesn't go live and you'll be eliminated okay, within a period of time. So there's a time limit. Okay? It doesn't mean that it stays there forever. Okay? But some businesses have evolved as a result of Kickstarter okay, funding. So these are actually going to be here for a long time. So gone are days where you must depend on your loved ones for money or go to the bank or even borrow okay, to start business. You can look at Kickstarter. Okay? All right. So another key thing, uh, because of COVID situation, a lot of you probably are really generous. You donate away your funds of $300 or $600 that was given by the government. Donation.sg, donation which is a charitable uh, website, leverages on crowdsourcing. So how do they source? They source for your funds. They ask you, okay, you have $300, you have $400, you have $600. Okay, you don't know what to do or you find that you are a bit rich, you don't really need this extra cash. Why don't you donate to me? Okay, put it into my website. Pledge your money to me, I'll collect from you, and then once I collect this donation from you, I will distribute to the rest of the charities or beneficiaries. Okay, so outside in, I go to the market, I tell everybody, okay, this is my idea. All these funds that is unutilized or you, you find that there's no very much financial need for, give me the funds, I will help you to donate to all these charities, okay, to get you um, to be actually very much contributing to society in a bigger way, right? So outside in. Very, very common. Okay, so inside out, that's actually the, the, the other pattern. Inside out is when I take ideas, okay, develop them in the lab, develop them in the dorm, I develop them in the garage, okay, I look at the first prototype before I push it out to the market and let the market respond. So here, there are secondary markets, there are licenses, there are innovation customers, and you can spin off, you can charge them for licensing, you can actually sell away your whole business model. Okay, so Inside out is what a lot of companies are very used to, okay. But uh, outside in is the emerging way of business models, okay. Today, so Dyson, Dyson Corporation, that's based headquarters in Singapore, okay. So the founder of Dyson, okay, okay, Mr. Dyson himself, okay. Anyone wants to make a guess how many times they have actually gone through a lab test to get this uh, backless vacuum? It's five thousand seven hundred and thirty-six times of failures. Okay, so 5,736 times of failure in the lab before he created this prototype. Okay, and when he created this prototype, he wasn't very sure whether people will pay okay, thousands of dollars or a couple of hundred dollars for this. Okay, something that doesn't have a back, okay, or even doesn't have wires or cords. So you're so used okay, to vacuum cleaners, but coming with a cord or coming with a back. So here it's coming to give you something that doesn't have any of these two features but he's going to charge you a lot more, okay? And are you prepared to pay him for his 5,736 times of effort? Well, I'll be more than willing, okay? So me, so will you. Okay, uh, this is something that, that evolves out of Singapore, okay? A lot of you doesn't really know. NTU, uh, about two years ago, 
has really launched out their autonomous bus. Okay, uh, autonomous bus, interesting in a sense, there's no driver. Okay, this is actually a campus bus. It brings actually students around the campus, uh, no driver at all. It uses infrared sensors, and it's a collaboration between NTU, LTE, and Volvo. So when this autonomous bus uh, concept comes about, it was just between NTU and LTE. So it happened in NTU's lab. So scientists okay, or researchers were trying to see whether autonomous vehicles can work. And, and it's not just a car, they put it into a bus. Okay, and these are fetching real humans, students, the future of our generation. Okay, and they are going around campuses from stop to stop. So, so this bus itself, uh, you'll not be able to see anywhere unless you go to NTU. Okay, and Volvo came along much later on because Volvo is actually an automobile uh, company. They actually give a lot of deeper insights. Okay, to this autonomous bus. So Volvo itself has always been well known. Okay for very enduring vehicles, okay? Uh, and Volvo now is actually adding a lot more to this gameplay. So inside out, everything that started in the lab, okay? Time tested, okay? And now it's being rolled out to the audience, okay? So with that, okay, I, I've spent a lot uh, about actually talking about all these business models, okay? I just want you to have a moment of reflection, okay? I've shared five patterns, I've shared business model canvas, Okay, there are many business models I have mentioned about, etc. Okay, but if we recall what we've gone through, okay, I would like to ask a particular question. Uh, and obviously, in the interest of time, I will not be able to ask everyone, but this is something I usually do in class. Okay, I will have moments where we go into a bit of hands on practices, exercises. Okay, we examine each of the business models, we give moments of reflection, let people think about business models, what are these, and so forth. So, uh, this is something I usually do because when you go into a class, when you go into a training workshop, it's extremely boring when you're just hearing from me. I would love to hear from you. Sometimes you guys can advocate me more about business models than I am doing now. Okay. So these are some of the things that we do. And with that, okay, I just want to point you to, to, to how this actually webinar series comes about. Okay, this webinar itself uh, was taking part of this certified business innovator. It's a professional certification that, that um, I conceptualize and I work with Avanti's team to develop. Uh, because you see, when the government itself is advocating okay, about companies, okay, getting organizations to change and so forth, nobody really examines business model. If you notice, people always talk about business model, you should evolve, you should change, but nobody really tells you the, the tips, the tricks, and the roadmap okay, to change your business model. And that's where I think the, the certified business model innovator will be really important. Okay, and for students who are actually also uh, intending to enroll for this graduate diploma in digital transformation, it's one of the modules inside the four modules. So you will see me as well as one of your faculty, okay, delivering the contents. And last but not least, okay, for some of you have, who have been contemplating joining us for MBAs, or you have ever thought about taking an MBA, this certified business model innovator certification is given complementary okay, to our MBA students. So what are we saying here? You go into MBA, yes, you walk away with a chemical qualification, but you will also get a professional certification, okay? Something that's exciting, something that's enriching, and most important, something that's really sought after, okay? To give you more than just a chemical qualification. So these are the three things that I will be really much involved. Um, I would like to actually just open up to the floor, okay? Um, do, do you all have any questions? Um, if you have questions, I would like you to start putting in your Q&A, putting in your chat, and then we can actually resume from here. Okay, let me just start off by looking at some of the questions I am seeing here. Okay, uh, isn't competition another name for cartel? Okay, this is legally forbidden in most developed countries. Okay, all right. Okay, competition, yes. Uh, I would say cartel is present, it's a business model, but cartels, are actually oligopolies, okay? That's a market structure. That's not a business model. Business model has nothing to do with structure, okay? Market structure is when you go into certain industries, okay? All these companies agree, okay? That I should subscribe to this way of doing things, okay? And this is industry specific. Business models are firm specific, okay? In other words, individual firms, everyone would have a different business model. Okay, and cartels is market structure. Cartels will not be business model. Okay, I hope that answers your question. All right, 
Okay, so competition itself is actually more than just a, a, a way. So I'm, I'm opening up to look at some of your other questions. Um, okay, can, can I actually have people asking questions? Um, do you all have any questions after going through this? Um, let me look at, do a quick run through. Um, Okay, I, uh, I'm hearing from Claudia. Yes, okay. I do agree, housewives have nothing better to do. Not really nothing better to do, I would say. Okay, I guess it's just that society's evaluation okay, of your inputs are a bit different. Um, and there's also, that's also one reason why housewives' inputs, right, are not factored as part of the income for gross domestic product, GDP. Okay, but definitely, okay, as a family man, I cherish my wife, I cherish what she has done. And obviously, I think your spouses have, have appreciated what you've done. It's just that we, it's very difficult for us to put a dollar in a sense. And, and of course, having said that, business models, right, can't really put your inputs, okay, in, into a, a, a form of um, actually business structure, right? But definitely, I'm, I'm sure people do appreciate. It's just that probably sometimes we can, cannot really express too well. Um, okay, uh, let me see. Uh, okay. Okay. So, so in, in this case itself, um, I guess we have actually a fair bit of of contents. Um, it's probably a bit hard for a lot of you to digest. Okay. I think you have, if you have any questions after this, okay, feel free, okay, to ask um away in the chat session. Okay. I'm seeing two questions here. All right. Um, what business model innovation ideas will you recommend to the F and D market? Okay. I think that the, the actually the government has always been advocating digitization. Okay. However, let me let me share with you a bit more about digitization. Okay. If if the whole industry, okay, if the whole F and B industry, everybody is going to digitization, where's the innovation part? There's no innovation then. You're just following your account. Digitization is just a method. It's not a means to an end. Okay. When you're looking at F and B, I think what you should be looking at is looking at actually possibilities of adding long tail. Okay, or combining different ideas that I mentioned earlier. Okay, maybe instead of you going for long tail, because long tail, not every FMB outlet can carry so much product, right? Maybe you want to go into a subscription mode. Let me give you a case in point. For example, if you know that I've already been buying from you, okay, uh, for buying from this FMB joint for the last two weeks, okay, you know, I, I appreciate you very much and I've been buying regularly, right? So, what's stopping you from suggesting to me? How about instead of you waiting for me to order through your website? Okay, or your business, um, actually app. Okay, why can't you just come to me directly and say, okay, uh, dear Mr. So, uh, thanks for patronizing us in the last two weeks. We noticed you probably have been ordering a fried chicken, okay, uh, in the last two orders. Perhaps we could suggest, okay, or we could actually come up to you with a special offering just for you, okay. We we can actually have this package where we can deliver fried chicken to you once every month, or maybe once every three months for this very special price. You see, a lot of businesses, especially FMB, are just too passive. You are waiting for customers to come to you. You are waiting for ideas to flow to your head. And FMB owners itself, they are wrestling with so many operational issues today. I think it is about time, okay, that you need to look at more than just um, actually operational issue. Now is actually the best time for you, for you to evaluate strategic issues. And here, subscription can be one. You can also be crowdfunding crowdsourcing. Uh, so crowdsourcing, how can it be rich? You can actually ask your customers for ideas. Okay, share with me. What other new flavors would you like to have in the next product to come? Oh, by the way, talking about that, McDonald's, you know they have actually an uh, R&D innovation lab, right, in Singapore? So that's where you get your national marks, okay, where you get actually your, um, actually your prospect burgers so and so forth. So these actually new products came from where? These products came from actually your customer feedback, okay? They bothered to visit. They know your taste. That's why they went back to the kitchen and they came up with something. So I think f and joints, you can do a lot more, right? Okay, and um, some other questions. Okay, what prospects or jobs can we expect from this diploma in digital transformation? Then my question back to you is, okay, can you tell me what businesses are not really in business today? Because every businesses today they have to morph. They have to examine their business model. It is really very hard for me to pinpoint a particular industry or particular career that you can go for. Because 
you can find yourself invest in many different ways. If you're at the top of management, yes, you have to look at strategies, you have to look at business models, you have to look at pricing mechanisms, so on and so forth. If you're at a media manager, you probably will get yourself involved in product process and even a service innovation. So even at the junior levels, you can actually even embark in incremental innovation. Okay, so it's innovation itself as much as it's a password. I want to demystify that once and again. It is not for people sitting at the top of organization. It's actually meant for everyone. Okay, and that's why the government is going out in a big way to tell businesses it's time to change. For people like people who are looking for jobs, it's time to transform, it's time to move. For people who are actually seeking for a next opportunity, the opportunity is right in front of you. So the question is, why are you doing it? Right? right? If you are unwilling to change, unwilling to explore, uh, I pretty much raise my point. Okay. So if you are very, very passive, I think you have to be a bit more proactive, right? Okay. And um, the the other questions that I have, okay, I have Norani. Uh, okay, Norani, thanks a lot for sharing your background. Um, I guess actually the innovation techniques itself is not only just confined to this. Okay, there's a lot more. Uh, unfortunately, because of time, I have only so much I can share. Okay, I have other series which I normally cover in the CBI, Certified Business Innovator, where I talk about techniques and strategies. Those are much more enticing. Okay, because those are walkaways. Those are things that you can see every day, and these are things that I could actually help you okay, to redesign your business model. Right? Okay, uh, for Peter Wise, I, I think Peter, just to answer your question, I think you, you could actually um, take a look at this webinar because it's actually you know, recorded, it's recorded live as we speak. So you can find actually live in, in YouTube, in Facebook, or even in our Instagram. So I don't think that that will be a need for us to go back. Okay, because don't want to hold back, hold back everybody, all right? Okay, I, I guess I've answered a lot of the questions. If you do have any question, uh, I would like to trouble all of you, okay, to drop Emily an email, okay? Emily will relate that back to me. With, without further ado, I wish you the best, okay? I, and I hope to see you in class soon. If I don't, okay, um, take care, okay? Stay safe and stay healthy, all right? Thank you for your time and thanks a lot for, for spending the last one and a half hours with me. Thank you.